um, uh, that will help them to address it. Because the reality is, and I mean, this is just a fact, and I say this as a therapist. I mean, my professional background ultimately was as a therapist, and that's how I set up one in four in the UK. Um, uh, healing is not just possible uh, uh, when you're trying to deal with childhood trauma. It's actually inevitable if we provide the right conditions. I mean, just like if you cut your hand and you keep it warm and dry and treat it properly, it will heal. I think the same is true of emotional or psychological trauma. It's what we do. It's what life does. It tries to heal itself. You might be left with a few scars, but you learn how to take care of them. Life, can, it can always get better. It can always be better if we give people the things that they need in order to move forward. And counselling and therapy certainly helps. Um, at various, you know, in different ways for different people at different times and over different periods. But it needs to be available to people when they're open to it. And it's not. So we have a huge responsibility uh, um, to provide the kind of resources that are necessary. And they're not huge resources. And it does make sense to make those resources available to people. If you think that 27% of Irish women and men have experienced sexual violence as children, 27%, one in four. So statistically, one in four of the people in this room, I'm not the only person who has had that experience, will have had an experience of childhood sexual abuse. And it has an impact on life. Do we as a society, uh, um, you know, never mind the fact that surely it's not acceptable to us just from a perspective of basic humanity that we're not responding to people's needs. But can we afford for a quarter of our population not to be living their lives in as fulfilled a way as possible, not to be contributing to society? When you look at the impacts in terms of relationship breakdown or difficulties, addictions, mental health issues or difficulties, depression, self-loathing, all of the, all of the difficulties, self-harm, all suicide, all of the issues that can be around it all, those are problems that as a society we can't afford to deal with. You could say as an, as an economy we don't if you needed to take it to that place, and I understand that we do have to sometimes. But either way it makes sense to deal with these issues and we should deal with them. So it's, it's not acceptable that the resources aren't put in place to deal with those kinds of issues. And by the way, we have a legal obligation to do so. I mean, Ireland has signed up to international treaties that say that you, I, and everybody else living in this country has a right to the highest attainable standard of mental health. And that means that the government must transparently, so must show that it's investing money and resources in a way that continues to improve upon the availability of those kinds of services to people living in the country. And we're not doing it. So under international law, we have that obligation. It makes sense from a basic place of humanity, and it even makes sense economically, so we should do it. But the political will is the issue. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Brian, right behind Daryl there. Uh, I'm just wondering, is it time that the roles of the guards and the other key figures in the judicial system uh, who were involved in the cover-up of those in the Catholic Church, who perverted the course of justice and protected those who abused the young and innocent from the law, were investigated properly? Well, both of the, the investigations that I was involved in securing, the Ferns Inquiry and, and the Commission investigation at the Dublin Archdiocese, were not focused on the church. Uh, and, and, and to me, that was, you know, from very early on in the process, that's what I was determined that we would achieve. That this wasn't simply about what did bishops do, because actually, when it comes down to it, it's not up to bishops. It's up to civil society, it's up to the state, it's up to the guards, it's up to child protection services, it's up to government. Uh, uh, to pr properly protect people living in this country. So both inquiries, the Ferns Inquiry and the Dublin Inquiry, we made sure that they investigated the response of the church and state authorities to complaints, suspicions or allegations of child sexual abuse perpetrated by priests. And they did that. And in Ferns, they made particular findings. In Dublin, they made many more. And in Dublin, obviously, they made findings that the, the Gardaí had uh, um, covered up in a number of cases. In other cases, they found that they had been managed well but they certainly said that there were huge problems of complicity within our legal and criminal justice systems. That is being investigated. There are criminal investigations ongoing at the moment, right now led by the guards, <laughs> uh, um, about, about some of those cases. But we also have, and this is something Amnesty campaigned for, for 10 years, long before I got involved with Amnesty. Amnesty were campaigning for a Garda Ombudsman Commission, for an independent uh, body that investigated complaints against the guards, because up until then, Effectively, the guards investigated themselves. So we have, the, we have the means now to carry out those kinds of investigations. And obviously, if people have com committed criminal offences and they have covered up crimes and those are criminal offences in and of themselves, they should be prosecuted. The reality is, though, 
Um, uh, and this is my view. Um, it's very unlikely that we'll ever see a bishop in Ireland charged with covering up child sexual abuse. Because uh, the simple fact is, until 2006, um, uh, there wasn't a criminal offence on the statute books. There was no law that said it was a crime to do that. Uh, it was one of the things we managed to achieve through the Ferns Inquiry. I managed to get the Ferns Inquiry to recommend the creation of a new criminal offence, the reckless endangerment of the welfare of children. And that's now on the statute books. So there's now a crime. But you can't use a new law to prosecute somebody for something that wasn't illegal at the time that they did it. So we're unlikely to see those prosecutions. There may be prosecutions for perverting the course of justice, but, and there should be, in my view, if the evidence can be found. But it'll take some time to see whether or not that happens. OK, thank you. Hayley, do you have a question? <coughs> just, again, the same role there, Orla, just at the very end. Um, do you feel abuse has uh, become something that defines who you are? Do, I, do, do you feel abuse has become something? Uh, do, do you feel abuse um, is something that defines who you are? Do you feel that abuse is something that has defined who you are at times? Uh, no. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I know that uh, <laughs> I've written that, <laughs> which is in part of it. And the work that I've done over the over the last ten years has obviously centred a lot on. Uh, child sexual abuse, and now with amnesty on, on, on abuse of other human rights more broadly than that. Um, so I understand that for, for some people I might be seen as, oh, that's your man who set up that organisation, oh, he was your man who was abused by the priest. And so I get that that's what people might see, but of course that doesn't define who I am either. Um, and I think the reality is that for most of my life I certainly felt that it did. You know, I felt that the things that happened to me were my fault and that I was bad and that it was, I was the one who was to blame for everything that had happened to me. Um, and I hated myself for it because I wasn't able to look and deal with what had actually happened to me. But I, um, I think it's how we respond to terrible things that happen to us that defines who we are, not the things themselves. So I think once, once we're in a position in our lives where we're able to make real choices, you know, until I was able to face what had happened to me, and name it and acknowledge it and climb into the bloody awful feelings that existed all around it and work them out for myself and then make real informed choices, choices based on what I knew rather than what I feared, um, then those choices say an awful lot more about who I am than a thing that happened to me ever would. It was an experience that I had. It was a hugely traumatic, very damaging, uh, uh, terrible experience. But no, it, it doesn't define who I am. <laughs> 